Welcome to the RevOps Lab, a podcast exploring the art and science of revenue operations. To find more episodes and resources on scaling your revenue engine, visit getweflow.com slash RevOps. Hey, Yannis. Hey, Philip. So what's up in today's episode? Yeah, in today's episode, we were chatting with Hayden Kostman from SoulSafe about the metrics that they use to measure the cost and benefits of customer success. And then how these metrics can also be used to drive efficiency and help answer the question whether this is a customer that is worth keeping. So enjoy the episode. Hey, Hayden, how are you? I'm good. How, how are y'all? Fantastic. Good. Can't Excited about having you here. Um, I mean, maybe you can give the audience a quick introduction. Who are you? What do you do? How did you get to where you are today? Yeah, more than, more than uh, happy to and excited to be here as well and, and chat with you all uh, today. So um, I'm uh, Hayden Cosman. I am uh, a senior rev ops manager at, at SoSafe, which is a uh, cybersecurity awareness uh, platform. So the softer side of cybersecurity, focusing on the human factor. Um, I'm the business partner to, uh, to the VP of, of CS. So I cover all the post-sale side of, of, rev, of rev ops off the off the a forgotten redheaded stepchild uh, of, of, of go to market, so to speak. Um, and, and I've been uh, for all my SaaS career uh, in CS or in post sales. So before that, um, I was at, at Leapsum, which is an HR tech uh, company there, um, saw a lot of scaling, was employee number 40 or so, helped build out the, the CS ops uh, department, department there and, and, and left to, to join SoSafe. Around six months ago, by the time uh, of, of my departure, uh, Leaps it was around 180, 200 employees. So, so saw a lot of a lot of growth um, over that period, and, and so save right now is is around 400 400 employees. So, sort of that that scale up sweet spot, so to speak. And uh, before that, um, I had a brief tenure as a as a PhD candidate, but decided that the ivory tower of academia was was was, was not for me. Uh, and uh, before that, uh, I will work as, as a CSF at uh, Lena X, which recently got acquired by, by SAP. Um, one of the uh, what is uh, German unicorns of the enterprise architecture space, which is um, sort of falls on the IT strategy uh, category of business transformation. Um, and before that, uh, we did a bit of management consulting. Um, originally from grew up in, in New York, been in been in Germany for for around seven years. Um, but uh, come from a, a German American background, so it's sort of uh, the, the best of the worst of both worlds, uh, so, so so to speak. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, awesome. Uh, so you got recommended uh, by a friend who runs CS, um, and today we want to talk about, you know, start off with the financial metrics that matter in RevOps, and then what that actually means for CS ops. Um, so I mean, let's kick off, right? Like. What are the financial metrics you actually care about? Yeah, I, I mean, so maybe just a, just a, a, a bit of context and, and, and why I think it's sort of so fascinating is that, you know, so, so uh, RevOps is so safe as part of the finance function. So we roll up to the CFO. And so it's a bit, uh, it, it was a bit new to me. I was sort of more come from a process operations background. I, I think that often sort of the FP&A top line planning side of things is, is a bit uh not always forgotten, but at least in smaller orgs, um, to to a, to a large degree, so the more focus on, on processes and automation and efficiency, and so really, what what I focus on or understanding is how do you know how do we service our customers at the right uh, with the right correct gross margin that aligns with um, basically efficient growth. So are we spending money? efficiently to retain customers um, in the in, in the correct segment or, or category basically how do we allocate our, our resources from a personnel standpoint as well as from um, sort of uh, other aspects operations etc so I would say a gross margin is, is super important and also understanding um, you know NRR net revenue retention is this is, is super important um, I'm definitely a fan of the the cohort based model not of the uh, so-called uh, lazy NRR to quote uh, uh, Dave Dave Kellogg. Uh, if you've uh, seen, uh, he has a great blog about all things uh, SaaS financial metrics and how you, know, you can spoof your numbers if you want to, um, and and all of that 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 jazz. So that's super super important. So NRR gross margin, 
as well as the split um, of, I would say, CS cost between COGS, so cost of goods sold, and, and OPEX, right? So what is how much of, of CS is focused on commercial aspects and how much is sort of focused on making the customer successful. And that sort of, I think, is generally reflected in, in the financial reporting of, of the company and how, and how CS is viewed internally. In addition to that, I think is something that is often forgotten and not something you report on, but uh, customer retention costs or, or average costs to, to serve um, is something that, you know, is not taught as a lot about, but I, I think it's one of the most valuable metrics in understanding post-sales efficiency. So not only looking at like CS personnel costs or, or tech stack costs, but how much does it cost to, for us to service a customer across the org? So that could be looking at, at GNA, how much of GNA resources are dedicated to customers, how, how often the, the, the new product engineering focus on resolving customer issues, right? So those are costs that are allocated towards, you know, fixing customer problems that could be invested in, um, you know, improving the products or, 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 or other aspects. So I, I think that those are sort of the ones that I would highlight, um, but uh, as well as, of course, um, gross revenue retention, churn rate, obviously all, all those are standard ones. But I, I think those are the, the first four that I mentioned are, are, are the key ones or, or, or how um, we think about um, how those metrics steer our, uh, our sort of strategy and, 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 and CS at, at Sozo. And uh, I mean, one thing, a lot of people in the audience will now ask themselves, okay, how do you actually get to a model where you track those things properly and then you can attribute them, right? Especially service costs and then what's the gross margin of a specific customer? I mean, do you think this is, you know, only possible for the enterprise model or like mid-market to enterprise or is that a general approach? Um, do you look at it by customer or by customer cohort or yeah, how do you, how do you, how do you attribute it correctly? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, so for us, um, at least the gross margin aspect, um, we basically, so we have a wide customer base, so we have a, a, a large long tail and we have enterprise customers as well. So obviously the, the needs are different, right? And the costs associated with serving those customers and maximizing customer life, that value is, it is different. So, um, we do it by segment for those high level metrics. So we understand, you know, uh, for our at scale sort of low touch segment, uh, our personnel costs, how many tickets or then from those segments are be worked on by engineers. And so we're able at least to get a, a segment or tier, uh, level understanding of, uh, of, of those costs. I mean, again, it's just, it's just a model, right? I mean, any investment banker or, uh, corporate finance person will tell you garbage in, garbage out, but I think it's important to, uh, to, to understand at least how we, uh, use data to inform strategy inform our strategy or approach without being overly reliant on, on, on data, if that makes, if that makes sense. And, and, and curious to you, just mentioned, um, um, tickets that the engineers are working on. So that means, um, the actual customer success manager and support, that's something that you don't directly attribute. Um, you just check as a general value or like, how does that work? Yes. So, so support costs are, so, so on, on segment, right? So we have like tiers of support, right? So if it's simple support to get costs, um, we, we assign sort of a, a base numerical or, or Euro amount to, to a level of, of a ticket, right? And that's something we'll touch on or I'll touch on a bit later when it comes to customer retention costs on, on like on the per customer level. So that's built into the segments and then how many of those tickets get escalated to engineers as bugs and where they're coming and where they're coming from. So that's then how we uh, try to at least approximate the, 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 the costs of them. Obviously some bugs will affect all of our customers irrespective of segment. So that it becomes a bit tricky. Um, so that's something which we're not perfect at, but I, I think at least the, the, the thought exercise of, of thinking about, about that and, and that, Retaining customers is not just something that is limited to, to CS, but it is, is but those costs are reflected across the entire org, right? And, and that and those uh, and, and those costs not only cost us money, but also there's significant opportunity costs associated with it. 
right? The, the fixing problems, bug chasing, et cetera. As a CSM means you can't engage in commercial activities, upselling, more strategic discussions, which then, you know, sort of takes away from the value that you could then be providing the customers that are that reflected in, um, you know, NRR as well as customer lifetime value and, and, and retention. Just a quick question, like the like, service model at SoSafe, does like, that include upsells, cross-sales, and renewals, or what is included in the CS, just to give some context here? Yeah, so so CS is responsible for all uh, flat renewals. So just, you know, uh, if, if a customer comes in with a one-year contract at, at 10K ARR, and they want to renew at the 10K, then the CS average is responsible for, for, for closing that renewal. Um, for uh, expansion, uh, CSMs are responsible for pipeline generation. So they, uh, they sort of, we, we based on my customer success, um, qualified lead model and then AEs are the responsible for, for closing those, those deals. There's, um, uh, pros and cons to, 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 both. I think that, you know, we're just sort of, we're scaling, figuring it out and, and things will, will change as, as we grow. But right now, um, we at least want to have a clear delineation that CSMs are focused on renewal but also have an eye on upselling and expansion, but making sure that they're that they clearly communicate to the customer that they're not a purely commercial person, that they're not an account manager, but they're also there to make the customer successful with with the product. Which I think is always a, a difficult thing when it comes to having credibility as a, as a CSM, because I find oftentimes, especially with older or enterprise customers, they see CSMs as um, account managers or commercial based, and really communicating to them that. You know, your goal is to make them successful. You're not primarily driven by, um, you know, those uh, those commercial uh, targets. So you're not going to sell them anything that they don't need, so to speak. And so, with 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 what you just what you just mentioned, um, like the the level of conversations, I would imagine that you then have, um, right, with the different segments, they are quite like top level thinking about like okay what's the ideal you know kind of like customer profile who do we want to you know target more heavily from the marketing side what kind of like campaigns and so on um and then how do you tie that back um to you know sort of like more like specific customers um and you know sort of like that question um okay how should we actually deal you know with that specific customer like this you know 50k mid-tier um sort of like deal that you know has like quite a few tickets um is very tough to negotiate with it's probably not gonna you know be able to we're not going to be able to um expand the deal more sort of like you know how do you tie that back yeah i mean that's always the uh the uh billion uh euro question right is that not all revenue is is, is good revenue right and, and generally uh, I've found, and, and I don't have any data to back this up. This is purely gut feeling, but there tends to be an inverse relationship between the ARR and the level of support and competency of 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 the POC on the other end of the on the other end of the, uh, the 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 relationship, right? So, oftentimes, larger enterprise deals will be have a lot of resources internally. Will have more sort of competent and experienced people and want to do things independently. And smaller customers will be more reliant or for whatever reason have higher expectations of the service level that, that they're going to get uh, from from a CSM. So that's something that, that, that is, is tricky. So one thing that we're and we're building this out right now is you want to make sure that CSMs focus time uh, being aware of opportunity costs to cost us to bring a customer. Um, so we're building out something which we have a metric, which is a customer's ARR and how much they cost us at meeting. So we have a cost assigned to every meeting, um, every ticket, depending on priority. So we have a rolling metric of, you know, when that becomes inverted, then maybe it's time to, you know, it's not regrettable churn. It's good churn because that means that that customer goes away and that CSM or, or whoever can then focus their time on, on customers that are, you know, basically making us money, so to speak, um, and that are also right for expansion or, or have a valuable logo or, or stuff like that. So I would even say, I mean, it sounds very granular, but I think that's a helpful sort of steering mechanism for CSMs, especially, you know, our, our 
average sale price isn't isn't huge. I mean, we have a, a, a very large, uh, diverse customer base. Um, so they have a lot of things on their plate and they need to be able to, to prioritize, right? And, and to, to understand that, hey, you know what? This customer is gone. Uh, they're, we're, we're losing money in this customer. It's okay to let them share. And it's good for the company because at the end of the day, that time and that money can be invested in, in, in more value-added activities. And in the end, will result in, in healthy revenue growth instead of just sort of 2018, grab everything you can get, uh, money's free, <laughs> <laughs> uh, type of type of uh, type of uh, go to market motions that uh, that we uh, we we see that and there is a um for 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 better or for worse we've returned to reality which I think is uh, on, on the whole uh, a, a good thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot more healthy than some of the things we saw in 2020, 2021 for sure. But I mean, I'm I, I'm super curious, right? Like the 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 um this the service model you outlined is like segment based. And then you essentially tie costs to pretty much every touch point, it sounds. Um, but there's a big trend towards, you know, the idea of, okay, the onboarding phase and then, you know, the implementation phase is where actually the renewal is one, right? So really starting a lot earlier, being a lot more proactive on the CS side and uh, driving success that was promised originally on the sales side and actually delivering on that promise you know, if you measure everything and if every meeting has a value attached to it, right? Like, like, how do you balance that? Because that's obviously then contradicting it, it, it itself potentially, right? Um, yeah, curious what you think about that. Yeah, no, I mean, it's more that uh, I think that a lot of people get obsessed with with data and just only take that as something which is gonna I'm gonna base my decision purely on data, right? I mean, that's data is here to inform us and to be a complementary thing to you know, our qualitative or, 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 gut, or, or gut instinct, right? And, and so, for, for example, I, I totally agree. Onboarding is the most important thing and, and not only time to go live, but then also time to first value, right? So I think oftentimes that, that gets conflated with, okay, they're live, but some people think that go live is time to value. And, and that's not really what, what it is, is that, you know, you have to be able to demonstrate ROI and, and arm the, you know, your person of, of you know, your point of contact that respective, cust respective customer with uh, proving that, that, that your solution is, is generating value. So what I would say is that we over-index on onboarding and we have a large implementation team, even for, uh, you know, our average sale price, which is uh, not, you know, not that, that high, um, but because we want to make the, the customer successful because we know that's tied tied to to a rule. So in addition to that, we we track uh, time to expansion opportunity creation. So after the go live, you know which customers looking at those cohorts are being expanded on the the, the quickest, and at and understanding also the win rates of, of those, and, and looking at any sort of um, common variables that, that we have that we have there. And, and one thing you also mentioned. Um, of the support tickets is that oftentimes people will think the amount of support tickets is a negative sign. I would say that that's not always the case because a, a lot of support tickets, if they're like good support tickets, not just, hey, I can't log in or I lost my password, um, is a sign of engagement and, and they're using the platform and that they're getting value out of it and that ultimately good customers and customers that are going to use your platform want to be independent. They're going to be demanding. And they're going to probably su submit a lot of support tickets, but I think you have to distinguish between like lazy support tickets and support tickets that are actually a good sign. Right. And, yeah. and, and that's, yeah. a, that's a bit tricky. And I don't have the answer to how, you know, you figure that out. I'm sure there's a bunch of companies using, you know, old school machine learning, not, uh, not, not gen, not, not gen AI sort of build out those models uh, and, and all of that. But that's sort of how I, uh, Thinking about that, if that makes uh, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the level of engagement, right? You often in SaaS see it in product metrics, and they are extremely valuable and can drive, you know, essentially can, can be good proxies for uh, churn or renewal. But then I think the level of engagement, uh, this can be another, you know, data point to inform the level of engagement, right? Uh, most people, I, I would, I would. 
assume that there's a higher correlation between poor product metrics and also low engagement tickets, right? That uh, because they basically already they just accepted the fact that they'll never see the value that was originally promised. And then they're just going to churn, right? And, and we see that a lot, I think, in especially sales technology, talking to customers where they bought something for two years and the salespeople didn't adopt it because it's like, you know, typically uh, something they, they don't like to adopt. And then, you know, basically, um, yeah, they, they've made the decision already, you know, three, six months in, and they're gone and uh this is it's almost uh it, it would be very costly or impossible to rescue them uh. yeah no i i i i totally totally agree i, I think that's something which i you know learned at at, at lean ix and and working with sort of you know it strategy people is that you can have the best solution in the world the best software but if people don't use it it, it doesn't it doesn't matter right and and, and they're they're going to churn and I think something that is very clear or needs to be made clear also the POCs if they're engaged, at least at the very beginning, is that you know there's work for, for you to also do internally in terms of change management, getting resources and, and all that stuff. And, and how do we, how do you as a CSM, this is sort of more enterprise, enterprisey. I would even say not even focus on the ROI of the, like for the company, but the ROI for the individual, for your point of contact, right? How can... I help you get promoted internally with the success of this product, right? And then how can humans are inherently selfish? I mean, people can, can disagree and perhaps have a bit of a, a gloomy outlook on, on the state of humanity given the, the current uh, state, state of the world. But I, I think that oftentimes, you know, you need, you know, like, it needs to be clear to customers that there's also work to do on on their end, right? I'm, I'm sure everybody who listening to this podcast has seen a terrible Salesforce instance where somebody bought something and didn't hire the people that they needed from the outset to make the implementation work. And then adoption isn't there, the data is a mess, et cetera. So it needs to like, software can't be seen as an investment as a standalone product, but it also needs to be driven, change and behavior needs to be driven internally. And, and I think that often a lot of times that you touch on in sales technology is that people buy a solution and they think it's going to solve their problems, but it's really, it, it's, it's maybe 50% of the, of the answer, sometimes less. And, and I think that it can be a bit challenging to really communicate that and, and make sure that, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're helping your POC internally get the resources that, that they need. Um, to to make your product uh, successful, because ultimately, if your POC is successful internally, your product's successful, right? And, and they're going to uh, expand or uh, or stay with you for 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 a long time, and, and that's ultimately the the goal of, of every SaaS company is to, um, you know, have great customer lifetime value. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think everybody has, has been there. I certainly have been there like buying software and then <laughs> lacking the resources internally to really execute on it. Just last night, I actually remembered such a scenario <laughs> to think about it. They kind of like, it was like a 20 K deal and I, I was responsible for buying the software and then it failed. And honestly, I like just last night, like under the shower, I realized, oh, that was me. It was my fault that those 20 K get totally burned. But that, that's not what I wanted to actually share and <laughs> or ask you. Um, like one thing I, I think is also really important about measuring metrics is mm, if you, if you have, if you measure metrics, everybody has a very clear understanding of what these metrics are and how they are measured and why they are measured. I think, uh, this can help quite a lot in actually, you know, driving culture, driving behavior, um, and also creating great transparency. And I'm, I'm just curious, like how, how that is, how it's used at SoSafe. So sort of like, you know, where does it start? Where does this conversation around what metrics matter start and, and how it flows through the organization, I guess, in this particular case, uh, customer success? Yeah, I mean, so we're definitely a, a very metrics-driven org and, and analysis heavy, which, which is, is, very, uh, is very good. I think right now we have a long way, way to go, for sure, sort of. Throughout the entire org, I think sort of on the middle management and executive level, it's definitely there that everybody has an understanding. These are the metrics 
um, that that are driving revenue growth or or, or, or whatever that that may be, and, and then how does that inform sort of our, our decision making when it comes to resource allocation or strategy or, or whatnot? I think that ultimately the issue is you know everybody's working with not right not super clean data. I mean, if I see a clean CRM, uh, I, it's, a, it's a unicorn. It, it doesn't exist. Maybe it does, but uh, if it does, um, I would love to talk to that person. Um, I, I, but I just talk yeah. to just talk to WeFlow customers. Yeah, so. yeah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> very, yeah, very exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, uh, it's uh, it's just definitely something. Which is, no, no, no. I, I mean, <laughs> listen. Don't get me wrong. I mean, Salesforce is is you know it was designed in 1990. Nine, so there's you, you see the the aspects of the very legacy sort of systems architecture that they have and the, the weird systems, and it's not you know it's not very user friendly. Um, and I think HubSpot has made great grounds like there and a lot of innovations, but I think at the end of the day, it's a platform, and you need to treat that product. I know that one of your past podcasts talked about RevOps as sort of a product or and I think that that's sort of the way that. Like at least business systems or go to market systems need, needs to go, and that we treat everything like internal software product, and that there's a product owner or a product manager of these systems and understands the over the under overarching systems architecture, and is not afraid to say no, or that we'll do it later because that has you know, I mean it's the same thing, right? Tech debt is a very real thing in business systems, and then that affects uh, everything. And you know, having a solution which makes it easy for sales reps to enter the data correctly and to take those nodes and to make their lives easier and, and so that they spend time selling or, or doing those, the things that we, that they're paid to do and also that they like to do, hopefully, um, is, is, is definitely a, a, a net, to uh, that possible on the whole for sure. Now we'd lo totally lost track. <laughs> yeah. How do, where do we go from here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, yeah uh, I but, but I have, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Never run out of questions, but yeah. um, um, so so okay. So I mean, there's like you know the financial metrics. I'm yeah. sure there's many other metrics, right? Like uh, NPS, he said, like yeah. probably measure product, uh, um, you know, metrics. And um, let's assume everybody has all these metrics, right? And they yeah. are well presented. People trust them. People understand them, right? Like from your experience, like what are the key drivers to really drive CS efficiency? What are the things that that really have big impacts? Um, thing. Um, and, and 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 let's say maybe efficiency and effectiveness, right? And thing. like I think because it's I think it's we talk a lot about efficiency, thing. but it's not all about efficiency, right? It's about like how does the customer stay forever, right? That's what yeah. we want and yeah. expands, right? That's essentially the goal, like that's the vision. Um, so yeah, super curious what you you yeah. learned there. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, efficiency is one metric, but also like efficacy is, you know, or, or, or effectiveness of the various is, is at the end of the day, the most important thing. And I think that it depends if you go to market motion. Uh, I, I think that, you know, if you're, if you're an enterprise, you know, you don't have a single deal under 100K, all that stuff. It, it's, it's much more high touch, staying close to your, to your customers, understanding your needs, really being, being a partner in, in that way. So there, I think that enablement is really key and making sure that you're hiring the right sort of profiles uh, for those CSMs. And and oftentimes, so at, at Lead IX, it was often ex-IT consultants which really fit it super well because they understand the pain points, what they're going through. They can they can be a, a sparring partner for how do we model this? Okay, how do we fit this in, 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 into the product? Um, I think that for effectiveness at sort of a, a, a company like Sosa that has a, a large long tail as well as enterprise customers. I think that it like on, on the smaller end of things, it's how do we use data and 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 really use product data and, and event data in addition to qualitative data to identify those customers that are really ready to expand to the next bracket and, and whatnot. And that looks very different. I would almost say that scaled CS or or like Long tail CS is is uh, very um, is more almost like a marketing operations role at, at this point. In, in my in, in my opinion, I mean, it depends on the model. And then enterprise enablement, right? I think that oftentimes people focus on sales enablement, um, 
but CS enablement is super important and, and it often gets forgotten, I, I think, because there's the product side of it as, as well. Um, and I guess I'm rambling a bit, but in addition to that, I think one of the biggest things why customers, if you want customers to stay with you forever, product needs to also deliver the goods. And that's something which you need to have a tight um, feedback loop between CS and, and product. And, and I think that one thing that, you know, you need to distinguish is that big strategic bets sort of category, you know, if you're going to be a category creator, that's not going to be something driven by CS or sales feedback. But I think those marginal improvements on the product that really at least drive the value for uh, specific operational stuff is, is super important, um, especially because the customers feel like they're being heard. So if they submit a feature request and then gets implemented, that they, they don't feel like they're staring into ether. I'm sure everybody has dealt with Salesforce customer support and knows how frustrating that is. And, uh, you know, everybody just wants, just wants to be heard. And, and that's something which I think is, is, is also super, um, mm -hmm. super, super important when it, when it, comes, to, comes to that. It reminds me so much of my previous company, Fiverr. Uh, we serve large app and game developers. And what we found out is that the CS role had to change to become extremely knowledgeable in product extremely quantitative um, uh, and almost like almost like a solution consultant and closely linked to the product as you outline so that the iterative improvement to the product uh, make the product a lot better um, and and um, and so yeah this resonates really really well with me um, and I think it's something that some companies do great but many don't and then you know like uh, it is yeah, I, th I think the ripple effects are, are quite tremendous, right? Um, I, I personally am also a big believer that products should be in the market a lot, right? Like you should talk to customers a lot. And it's a lot easier to do that with existing customers than with the new local clients, right? The new local clients and product, that's sometimes a lot more challenging, I'd say. Um, but the existing customers, they know the reality, right? You don't, you don't sell them the dream, you sell them, they see the reality. And so you can have a lot deeper conversations really you know inform your product discovery that way and um and and yeah almost become like uh, one unit to to to, to serve as well you know? yeah no i absolutely and absolutely and that's something which i think is, is important to uh, something i did in the past and which we're we'll, we'll build out is, is tying clear you know revenue associated with the feature request right so how many customers are, are requesting this right if it's and I think that oftentimes people get obsessed with one big customer and their feature requests, but then you just end up being like, you know, you're not a, a customer uh, software developer for them, right? I mean, if they wanted that, they could they could hire hire that, uh, uh, you know, hire somebody to build software for them. So it's also about the the amount of customers, and that also is it reflected sort of across the all the segments, right? So is it something that everybody's asking for? Is it something that you know? only long tail customers are asking for. And then really also perhaps, you know, if you have the time, which RevOps people rarely do, uh, to, to or maybe product manage, management uh, could take a look is, is understand sort of, are there any um, characteristics that, that are in common between, between the customers that are asking for this? Or are these customers we consider to be advocates that are asking for, for this, right? And really know our product um, perhaps even better than some of our solution engineers. And, and I think when you, you touched on, on the sales part is selling the dream can often sometimes navigate you. And, and at the beginning, it, it makes sense. You've got to get revenue. You, you have to sometimes build stuff for particular large customers. There's trade-offs, right? But I think that as you scale, feedback in, in the sales process is important. But I think that, as you mentioned, customer feedback, because they know the reality, is more valuable and, and, and helps drive the iterative developments that will also have a bent like a that benefit for uh new business as well yeah 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 absolutely i mean and also i mean now hearing it again i, I think selling the dream is always an, a symptom of something going wrong on the sales side as well right like it's it's not what you want you want them to sell something that you can actually deliver on but it might be inflated by five or ten percent right that often happens uh, if it's inflated more than you know you typically face high churn and you know a lot of trouble down the line um it, so 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 i think it's something definitely to 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 avoid um but yeah i think i think this is great i mean 
um, I think we could continue. Maybe we need to do a part two of this, you know, going into pricing, professional services and all the other fun stuff. But uh, I want to ask you our closing question. I mean, if, if you, I mean, you, you, you've been doing a PhD, right? Like uh, if you would go back to, you know, you as the PhD at the brink of dropout, what would you tell yourself, you know, <laughs> to, so that you become, you know, uh, learn faster, grow your career faster uh, if, with what you know now? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I think for me, I mean, I guess this is probably going to be a, a not a, not a not a not a great answer, but like uh, I I found because I was one of the only people that had like professional experience before starting my PhD, and, and you know, it's in Germany, PhDs, especially business studies, can be a bit uh, overly academic, and and like in the American in the in the U.S., uh, business education is much more practical and applied, and so. I think that um, what helps is, and it's been helpful for for Iver, is at least being able to read and understand a lot of different viewpoints and and, and information in in, in a very uh, quick uh, quick quick time span and be able to synthesize all that information. But I would say that generally, a lot of people focus on their weaknesses, and, and this is something that's important, but. I think what's important for, for career growth is to, if you're really good at something, there's always a specialist role out there for you. And, you know, doubling down on something you're already good at is going to make you much better at that than somebody who is half as, has half the, the, the talent in, in that area, right? At the end of the day, uh, success in addition to luck in, in, in careers is, is just simply a function of your raw talent times hard work, right? And And that's obviously not evenly distributed between all your different uh, uh, skills or, or, or traits. Uh, change management documentation, not my strong suit. Uh, tend to be a bit of a, a, bull, a bull in the china shop, which is a, a blessing and, and, and a curse. Uh, but uh, it, it tends to serve a, a bit a, a bit better in, in Germany with its more uh, direct culture. But that's sort of what I would say. Um, uh, I know that's not really an answer to your question, but uh, that's, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's pretty good. My, my that's a great answer. Uh, Hayden, thank you so much. Really enjoyed this. Uh, thank you for being on the show. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure, uh, pleasure coming on and talking to you all. Um, and uh, yeah, always always open to to, to chat and uh, about uh, any anything and, and everything. Uh, Rev Ops and SaaS. Happy to happy awesome. to be here. Thanks for joining. Thanks so much. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the RevOps Lab podcast. Please consider to like and subscribe our show and give us a five-star rating on wherever you're listening. If you have feedback or suggestions, let us know at podcast at getweflow.com. We read and reply to every email. Thank you. Thank you.